Um, okay, so let me just give you a sense of whom you're going to be hearing from. Constance Fury is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Indiana University, where she specializes in early modern Christianity. Her book, Erasmus, Contarini, <coughs> excuse me, and the Religious Republic of Letters, was published by Cambridge University Press, and she's written essays about friendship and marriage, virtue and vitriol, errancy and discernment and mystic sexuality. Her current project, Crowded Interiors, challenges the view of selfhood we have inherited from Protestantism by exploring canonical Protestant poetry's interest in rel relational dynamics. Peter Hawkins is Professor of Religion and Literature at Yale Divinity School. Professor Hawkins' work has long centered on Dante, most recently in Dante's Testaments, Essays on Scriptural Imagination, the poet's Dante, 20th century reflections, co-edited with Rachel Jacoff, and uh, Dante, a brief, brief history. The poet features as well in his expansion of his 2007 Lyman Be Beecher, is it Beecher lectures, on preaching the under, undiscovered country, imagining the world to come. Uh, he does research in the history of biblical reception. He has got three edited collections uh, that have arisen out of that uh, out of that discipline. Uh, he's held fellowships at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford, Pembroke College in Cambridge, and he will, in the spring of 2015, be at the Center for Medieval Studies at the University of York in the United Kingdom. So please welcome with me Constance Fury and Peter Hawkins. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, there's many things that I've enjoyed very much about being at BYU, and uh, as Heather was just asking about the architecture of the library, that is among the many things. Uh, I am, though, sorry that we are in a room today without light, because one of the things that's so incredibly great about being here in Utah uh, is to, get to experience the um, light of high altitude. And I'm grateful to you all for coming in from the light uh, to be illuminated instead by the word, we hope. Um, so my thanks especially to Kimberly Johnson. And, uh, in fact, Peter and I were just talking beforehand. One of the other pleasures of this whole experience has been getting, to, for me, getting to work with Peter, whom I'd not met before. Uh, it's been a really exciting and enlivening experience for us. And we jointly would like to thank Kimberly Johnson, who I talked to, I think it was last March or April, about the very possibility of something like this. And then she just sort of waved her hands and then did a tremendous amount of organizational work behind the scenes. And then here we are, less than a year later, having the conference that uh, I just had sort of imagined in my mind, um, and she made it happen. Thanks also to the BYU Humanities Center and Matthew Wickman in particular, as well as all the other support that's been given by all of the welcoming gra faculty and graduate students, um, not to mention the dean and people with money. So uh, today what I will read is what I wrote yesterday, what wrote before I came, uh, but I want to think today about framing it in terms of two comments that were made over the course of our really wonderful exchanges yesterday that might help frame what it is I'm doing. One was Ryan Netsley's response to a question that I asked uh, where he talked about how Heather Dubrow's idea of poetry was as an engine of relation and compared it to his own desire to, refu re to refuse the imperatives of interrelation. Um, and Melissa Range, when she was responding to one of the questions, said, I have some, she said, when she talks, when she's thinking about doing poetry, she's thinking, I have something to say and I want you to hear it. <laughs> Um, but she was writing poetry, she says, in a way that reveals the awareness of some sort of community. She said that I wanted to, I wanted to do something that reveals awareness of some sort of community that I am not the center of. So be thinking about this sort of what would it be to have imperatives of interrelations, uh, and why would that feel like an imperative, and why might, might that feel constraining, and what might feel liberating or compelling about being um, some part of some sort of community that I am not the center of. So now I will begin the formal part of the paper. In Philosophy as a Way of Life, Pierre Adeau observes that lyric poetry invites us to establish a relationship of the self with the self. It's a beautiful way to think about lyric as an invitation to know oneself. It also betrays a classically secular and modernist solipsism. Devotional lyric, however, extends a different invitation. Speaking to and about God, however conceived, Devotional poetry does not, cons does not presume that we are alone within ourselves. Instead of imagining the self encountering the self anew, as if entering a hall of mirrors, devotional poems imagine the self's encounter with the divine. These poems might be, as Jay Hopler describes them, one-sided conversations, 
but they are conversations nevertheless. From the Latin conversare, meaning to move and dwell and keep company with, the meaning of conversation in England has only recently become focused exclusive, sorry, the only meaning of conversation in English, has only recently, and I don't know, England might have its own world of thought on this, <laughs> um, has only recently become fo focused exclusively on speech. The 1611 King James translation of Philippians 3.20, for example, has Paul confirming that our conversation is in heaven. The idea of a one conversation should st still seem like something of an oxymoron, but keeping in mind the more expansive definition of the word might give us a more expansive way to think about some, what some poems do. Offering not just words and seeking not just words in return, devotional poetry explores the action of living or having one's being among others. Yet modern readers concerned, as modern readers often are, with how it is we came to feel so alone in the world, too readily presumes that this means devotional poetry is preoccupied with tracking the presence or absence of the divine. Interpreters of devotional poetry from the English Renaissance are especially prone to prioritize these questions of presence and absence, for they seem the most direct way to, to assess this poetry's relationship to modernity. But it's important to remember that even a lament of absence is an acknowledgment of presence. This is the Mobius strip Augustine described, for example, in his Confessions. You were within me, and I was in the world outside myself. You were with me, but I was not with you. Like Augustine himself in some cases, we avoid confronting the mind-bending way of imagining the self in relation to God by retreating to a binary, to binary opposition, if self, no God, like if, the, if self, if God was inside, he was outside and so forth. But actually we have to remember that with Augustine, he, uh, he, God was within him even as he was outside of himself. So the one binary would be the if self, no God, or the if God, no self, or a dialectical resolution, the distinctions between self and God might be overcome in extraordinary mystical encounters or heavenly hereafter. But what I mean to be doing by invoking this uh, line from the Confessions is saying, no, this is really much more like this Mobius strip. You don't have either the opposition or the dialectical resolution per se. In the, in the Confessions, understood in this way, as in most devotional poetry, however, the question at stake is then not the presence or absence of the divine per se, but what it means to live and move and have our being with God. I agree with Ryan Netsley then that devotional poems from the English Renaissance are, quote, not about possessing or achieving God's affection or desire, but rather about how one responds, how one acts after or as one achieves it. What happens, though, if we accept this starting point, that what's important is not the sense of reassurance or betrayal, but instead, one how, but instead how one acts as one experiences God, and then shift our attention from the self, the one who acts, to the relationship that is enacted. What happens if we neither reify God as a separate being, setting up God as an other, standing in some sense apart from the self, nor assume, as Pierre Adot did, that this poetry ultimately directs us inward alone with ourselves? A way to do just that is provided, I want to argue today, by an often overlooked source, Trinitarian theology, which I'm invoking today here, not as a creedal doctrine or a liturgical affirmation of mystery, but instead as Christianity's own sophisticated theory of relationality. I begin with a somewhat anomalous example, Amelia Lanyard's generic merger of verse panegyric and devotional meditation in her volume, Salve Deus Rex Judeorum, published in 1611, the same year as the King James Bible. Dedicated to a countess, Lanyard's poems triangulates between the dedicatee, the speaker, and Christ. The poem is not, however, comparing each of these three to one person of the Trinity. Indeed, Trinitarian theology is most profound and here certainly most relevant because it can be about the reflexivity of three in one. Not difference sustained, nor sameness achieved, but the interactive relations that simultaneously distinguish and bind. I'll say a little more about Trinitarian theology in what, in what follows, but I wanna just first bring up an example from Lanyard's poems. There's a line where she says in one of her dedicatory poems, receive your love, directing her intended reader to, um, sorry, receive your love. In that way, the speaker of one of Lanyard's patronage poems directs her intended reader 
to listen to and, and respond to the poem. And this short phrase alone contains all the key elements of what I would call Lanier's Trinitarianism. There are three participants, the text, the reader, and Christ referred to here as love. And just as importantly, there is the recognition that a shared love between two is not really felt or experienced until a third is involved. The text, in other words, interposes itself to bring this love to life. Receive your love whom you have sought so far, which here presents himself within your view. The reader might claim Christ as an object of affection. He is already your love. But the experience of love that the text seeks to awaken is catalyzed by the text. Up to this point in the poem, the dedicatee has been praised as a paragon of virtue, hailed for following Christ's example by cultivating humility and faith and rejecting worldly pleasures. Now, though, attention shifts from virtue to love. And in his humble path, since you do tread, take this fair bridegroom in your soul's pure bed. From walking in his footsteps to tumbling into bed together, the countess traverses the boundary separating a devotional emphasis on virtue to a devotional emphasis on desire. In this way, the text presents itself not just as a matchmaker, but a catalyst. Like the chemical agent, that means it participates in the relationships it quickens. This is akin to the emphasis on relationality in Trinitarian theology. As I've said, an aspect of this theology that is sometimes de-emphasized, especially in forms of Christianity with Latin roots. Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians, by contrast, more characteristically revel in what is often called the social trinity. When I ask my students about the trinity, for example, what often comes to mind is the mystery of three and one. And as I asked one of my students about it last week, their response was, it's like an apple, she said. Uh, there's the peel, the flesh, the core. Three parts, all part of the same. I asked Peter about it the other day. He remembered from when he was young that he'd been, ex it had been explained to him this way. It's like an egg, got the shell, the white, the yolk, right? Three, one. Um, many pastors are afraid, to, uh, reluctant to say much more. I shouldn't have said afraid. Many pastors are reluctant to say much more. <laughs> Trinity Sunday, that was a Freudian slip. Trinity Sunday um, is still on the liturgical calendar, of course, for many Catholics and Protestants, uh, for Catholics and many Protestants, uh, but it rarely invites the sort of sermons that John Donne preached on that liturgical occasion in 1620. Donne, who invited his listeners to find vestigia trinitatis, impressions of the Trinity, in as many things as we can. For Donne the pastor, this meant that the Trinity established the primacy of community, and most, import, most importantly for him, the reciprocity of roles. From the beginning, as Dunn frequently reminded his congregation, God intimated a detestation, a dislike of singularity. God thereby endorsed the importance of reciprocity not only within the Trinity, but between God and creation, Christ and the church, pastor and congregation, and amongst Christians. Pastorally for Dunn, this could often devolve into an emphasis on reciprocal roles, a kind of you know, making something static uh, rather than the dynamism of the relationality. But in poetry, Dunn and some of his contemporaries explored exactly this, the relationality, uh, the capacious idea of relationality that is fully developed in much of the writing of Trinitarian theology. So I'm thinking, for example, of the fourth century Cappadocian bishop, Gregory of Nazianzus, who wrote, that although the essence of God is beyond comprehension, the person of God is both distinct and relational. And we might think of it this way, distinct insofar as it is relational. In this sense, each person of the divine trinity is a relational activity. We could put it another way. The three divine persons are coordinate realities denoting relationships. Like to even have the name God or Father, uh, Holy Spirit, is to denote a relationship. So even though Augustine's De Trinitate, for example, is best remembered for its psychological analogy, looking inward to find a triad of memory, understanding, and will, or the three parts of the soul, in the first half of that, that very, very important and influential work, Augustine similarly maintained that the divine names signify relationships. Later, the interpersonal elements of this were more fully developed by the 12th century mystical theologian Richard of St. Victor, for example. Richard was fond of this, uh, doing an etymological analysis of existentia, which he pointed out, so the word for existence, um, derived from the, from, with the first part, the prefix, prefix, prefix ex, from or out of, and sistere, to be, to be, to support his conclusion that to exist in oneself 
means to receive one's being from another. The Trinity, according to Richard, is then a mystery of interpersonal love, for the perfection of a single person requires association with another one. And Jan von Riesbroek, whose writings influenced the Devotio Moderna movement, which was mentioned yesterday, and through them some Protestant piety, radicalized this claim with language of divine indwelling, describing God as a flowing, ebbing sea. He contended that the flowing of God always demands a flowing back. This interactivity, he says, is unending, except when it's distorted by self-regard, which traps the dynamic within. The problem of self-regard or sinfulness was, was actually paramount for both Luther and Calvin, the influential theologians for Protestantism, who therefore showed little interest in the inherent reflexivity or relationality of the divine that so captivated many earlier thinkers. But something like this fascination with how relationality differentiates and unifies is evident in Lanyard's poetic description of love and Dunn's plea, as, we will as I will mention briefly at the end, in Batter My Heart to be ravished by God. When Lanyard writes then, as she does in the preamble to her title poem, that offering the text and reading the text are alike sources of delight and desire, she clearly equates the effect of Christ's love and passion with this process. As thou no labor wilt refuse, that to thy holy love may pleasing be, his death and passion I desire to write, and thee to read, the blessed soul's delight. To write of Christ is to describe Christ, to use the poetic power of language to make him present, immediate, lovable. The efficacy of this depends on the reader's love for the text, a love that can in turn be called holy insofar as it communicates Christ's love. Thus, Christ and the Countess and the text all participate in this triangulated apprehension and expression of, his, of love, his death and passion I desire to write, and thee to read, the blessed soul's delight. Describing the Countess as one who desires to read Christ's death and passion, or to read salvation in Christ's precious wounds, Lanyard conveys that the activity of apprehending and comprehending is more important than the images of death, or even compassionate identification with Christ's suffering. Active engagement is itself the delight. Active engagement is itself the manifestation of love. Many interpreters have, in, have conflated this interactivity with an economics of exchange. Naomi Miller, for example, writes that in the revised triangulation of desire in Lanyard's sequence of poems, Christ provides a divine focal point around whom women can join with one another in a worship that excludes all earthly men from Adam to Pilate. This is the danger of sort of taking too static a notion of the, of, the, of the triangulation. Envisioned in this way, Christ stands still, possessed of a magnetism that rearranges the objects around him, but not participating in the relations themselves. In Lanyard, by contrast, the focus is not on how desire positions the subject or dialectically overcomes the boundaries between subject and object, but instead how the interplay brings love to life. The text then does not dispossess the self as ecstatic notions of the Holy Spirit suggest it might, but instead, me instead mediates it. The text, in fact, might be understood as a form of mediation akin to the Holy Spirit. And in this way, we might bring to mind the, that devotional poetry works something like Lectio Divina, especially as it was developed in monastic Christianity. This idea of meditative reading, where the savor of the experience is more important than the scientia or knowledge of the words. The distinctiveness of Lanyard's focus on the dynamics of desire, not fixed but effective insofar as they are catalyzed, is highlighted by her poem's account of a suffering Christ. The usual object of Imitatio Christi meditations and a somewhat unusual focus for devotional poetry at the time. To take one example uh, by William Perkins in 1596, a contrasting example, he described Imitatio Christi as a mode of devotion where the believer should dive and plunge thyself wholly, both body and soul, into the wounds and blood of Christ. Like medieval predecessors, Perkins thereby is encouraging believers to identify with Christ's suffering. Lanyard, by contrast, wants believers to partake of the desire, to des the desire described. It is for her the interaction rather than the identification that will bring desire to life. So Perkins writes that whereas Christ gave himself to us, we can do no less than bestow hearts upon him and love him most, meaning that believers will come to love Christ 
by learning, being alerted to the fact of what they owe to Christ. We can see a similar focus, for example, in Nicholas Breton's verse narrative, The Countess of Pembroke's Passion, which also stresses again how the agonies of Christ's death might lead one to feel disgust for oneself, wonder and appreciation at the alternative ideal embodied in Christ, and then love, fueled by appreciation. This emphasis on pain is captured in one of Breton's opening lines, setting the scene by describing the darkening day when pleasure became a subject, of, subject all of pain. Lanya pro proposes a different devotional model by suggesting that reading itself inspires love and by emphasizing pleasure more than pain. One way she does this is by couching the brief references in her poem to Christ's suffering in beauty. She describes Christ hanging on the cross with joints disjointed and his legs hang down, yielding to a shameful death. But her narrative poem devotes just as many stanzas to elaborating on the bridegroom that appears so fair. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, in his spouse's sight, she says. But the speaker's delight in using language from the Song of Songs shows how she identifies desire with beauty rather than compassion understood as identification with suffering. That unto snow we may his face compare, his cheeks like scarlet and his eyes so bright, as purest doves that in the rivers are, washed with milk to give the more delight. His head is likened to the finest gold, his curled locks so beauteous to behold, black as a raven in her blackest hue, his lips like scarlet threads, yet much more sweet than is the sweetest honey dropping dew. That imagery from the last line recurs near the end of the poem, where the honey dropping dew of holy love is described as the love the martyrs felt, here, love is equated with an act of delight catalyzed by reading. Lanyard goes on to portray not just Christ's death, but also his resurrection in relational terms. Risen from death, he is attended by his faithful wife, the church, and offered is still accessible to the reader in the sensual images of loving bride and bridegroom. At this point, the narrator reasserts herself to affirm that rather than a flat picture or a dyad, this relationship with Christ was embedded within other relationships. So she says explicitly that her text, the written description of Christ, conveyed Christ to her reader, that her inadequacies as a writer were remedied by the reader's powers of perception, and that Christ became a living presence in and through this interaction. Ah, give me leave, good lady, now to leave this task of beauty which I took in hand. I cannot wade so deep. I may deceive myself before I can attain the land. Therefore, good madam, in your heart I leave his perfect picture where it, still, where, it still shall, where it still shall stand, deeply engraved in that holy shrine, environed with love and thoughts divine. There may you see him as a god in glory and as a man in miserable case. There may you read his true and perfect story, his bleeding body there you may embrace. And kiss his dying cheeks with tears of sorrow, with joyful grief you may entreat for grace, and all your prayers and all your alms deeds may bring to stop his cruel wounds that bleeds. Alone, one might have self-deception equated here with the dangerous allure of beauty, but this peril is avoided when beauty is equated with a picture environed with love. The Christ described and thus possessed through the interaction of reader and writer is in turn affected by the reader's loving response. If then, as Bernard of Clairvaux says, there are only two evils which war against the soul, an empty love of the world and too much self-love, then devotional love presents itself as the essential alternative. Much has been made within Christianity and in a different register and in theory as well uh, of the distinction between selfless and selfish love, described in Christian terms as the difference between agape and eros, or caritas and cupiditas. But the crucial question is really whether the only alternative to self-absorption or misdirected desire is self-loss. Do we need, as the theorists might put it, to be battered and abject, as Dunn, of course, also put it, uh, to die to self, to put it in Christian terms, in order to live in Christ? This isn't the form of love we encounter, actually, in most devotional poetry. There's the matter of the speaker, for one thing, who never, in fact, disappears from the page and only rarely claims to be completely subsumed. Devotional poetry is more often prayerful than mystical in this sense. But that does not mean that its interactively, interactivity can be easily described. How then should we enter, understand this interactivity? Is it just the means to an end, just a way to express love? 
or is the love itself interactive and the interactivity constitutive of the love? In Christianity, as I've argued today, the most fully developed way to talk about love as interactive is Trinitarian theology. If the first poem that comes to mind when I mention Trinitarianism is John Donne's Batter My Heart, Three-Person God, then it seems that the Trinity might just be a way to gang up on the one who prays. That Trinitarianism is then a way to intensify what Dunn calls the deprehension of the self. Others here have demonstrated how a formal analysis challenges that claim. Kimberly Johnson argues, for example, that in the wordiness of the word, uh, that this poem, the, um, in this poem in particular, the trope demonstrates the impossibility of referentiality and instead incarnates itself. The medium becomes the message. Language itself is sanctified. This is one way to think about presence as something other than the opposite of, of absence, the poetics of non-absorption. In a complementary analysis that similarly challenges the assumption that the intensity of Dunn's language reveals anxiety about his distance from God, Ryan Netsley argues that devotional poetry is about non-mercenary attachment to a God who is already present. It is about desire, in other words, without an aim. As I noted at the outset, I agree with Netsley that these poems aren't struggling with loss or seeking to restore wholeness as much as they are engaging with presence. And like Kimberly Johnson, I think the medium is the message. Though this analysis of Lanier, like a reading of Batter My Heart that we might do with this analysis in mind, seeks to suggest that the interactive dynamic of language, the interactivity of language, is part of the medium. Similarly, the inherent reflexivity of Trinitarian theology challenges the idea that the only alternative to an economy of lack, or even to a teleology, the heaven for hereafter, is no purpose at all. It challenges the idea that the only alternative is no purpose at all, a desire that has no aim or intention. Instead, what these poems refer to most insistently is interactivity itself, between speaker and God, speaker and reader, and a circuitry of reader and God. This has a kind of what Ryan Netsley talked about as a kind of imperative of interrelationality, but it is one that is contingent and variable. This is creative interactivity formally constrained, a kind of linguistic deprehension that proves the self cannot converse alone. I don't know why this came to me as a shock recently, but it did. In the middle of the Hebrew Bible, there stands a collection of 150 poems. <laughs> These songs in Hebrew tehillim or praises constitute a playlist that for millennia have given Jews and Christians a great deal to sing about. The Jerusalem temple, the Davidic monarchy, the joy of Torah, human wisdom and folly, general thanksgiving, and particular revenge. But more than anything else, the Psalms are about both the presence of God and God's absence, about what it feels like to be a believer, not only when your cup runneth over with thanksgiving, but when you feel yourself dried up like a potsherd, tossed into a pit, given up for dead. The emotional range of the Psalter is extraordinary, and so too is the power of the subjective I that speaks through it that gives the public we of Israel's collective experience the power of the first person account of an I witness. The Psalter's poems are exuberant, dramatic, given to mood swings. They're also empowering, giving us license to speak what we feel, not what we ought to say, to recall the end of King Lear. With God, there is nothing that cannot be said. The abyss is as much the place for prayer as the mountaintop, and raw talking back as licit as what John, call, John Donne called flattering speeches meant to court God. Praise predominates in the Psalter, whose final verse famously bids the entire creation to, a, to sound a corporate hallelujah. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 
Even the lament psalms usually make a final move from darkness to light. Something happens for the poet to turn a corner, make a volta, a dramatic shift in emotion. It may be the 11th hour arrival of a new insight, or an answered prayer, or perhaps simply the determination to say yes instead of no. Consequently, I rejoice, T.S. Eliot writes in Ash Wednesday, as we heard yesterday. Consequently, I rejoice having to construct something upon which to rejoice. In this regard, I think immediately of Psalm 22, which opens with a howl, Oren, a cry of dereliction that echoes from the Hebrew Bible to Jesus' last words in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist counts himself a worm and no man. He's mocked by enemies, poured out like water. His heart is melting like wax, his body all bones. In this terrible condition, he also wrestles with memory, wrestles with happy memory. Once upon a time, it was you who kept me safe in my mother's arms. Not now, as he tells us again and again, until suddenly, with a whiplash, it's back to the maternal embrace. For no given reason, and as if turning on a dime, the poet moves from lament to a crescendo of praise that grows in scope as the verses mount in an expanding ripple effect of celebration. Telling of the Lord's unexplained, undocumented deliverance to my brothers and sisters, the psalmist goes on to extend his reach to all the offspring of Jacob and Israel, to the families of the nations scattered across all the ends of the earth, and from the present day into the future to a people yet unborn. Despite this penchant for the happy ending, even one that comes only in the poem's end, there is another voice in the Psalter that continues to speak from the dark. Like the unrelenting poet of the Lamentations of Jeremiah, this psalmist refuses to be comforted, and for good reason. No ram ever shows up in the thicket, no sea opens up, and the dead say, stay dead without the transformation of dry bones into an exceeding great host of the living. Psalm 88, for instance, is located from start to finish in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. There's no volta to deliver from the abyss. Instead, God turns a deaf ear to the psalmist's cries, hides his face, or worse, turns away from him entirely. And you have on your handout uh, the ending of um, Psalm 88. I won't read it. That's the gist, however. Now, if we look at the afterlife of the Psalter in our language, from the paraphrasers of the 16th century to the legion of poets who have found in the Psalter inspiration for their own work, a number of whom are in this room, there is no one who catches its oscillation between praise and lament, its bipolar swing between all and nothing as powerfully as Jared Manley Hopkins. During his Jesuit novitiate in mid 19th century Wales, Hopkins had been very much the poet of praise. I mean, talk about the cup running over. He celebrated a world charged with the grandeur of God in which the pied beauty of dappled things became an occasion to celebrate the Creator's presence throughout the creation. There is, of course, a strong biblical precedent for this kind of poetic hurrahing, this itemization of reasons to shout hallelujah. Take Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, all fruit trees and cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things, and flying birds. In some of his sonnets, Hopkins places himself squarely in this catalog tradition of X and Y parallels, creeping things and flying birds. 
but typically he steers away from the gigantic to focus instead on the small. His eye is perpetually on the sparrow, if you will. In particular, he trains that eye to make much of what is quirky, eccentric, and imperfect, to cherish the bits and pieces of a freckled world. The second text on your handout. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of coupled color is a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim. Fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things, counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. In addition to poems like this, and evidently closely connected to them, are Hopkins' journals from this Welsh period, rich in his scrutiny of the divine presence in the miniature and idiosyncratic. A particular flower, a cloudscape, a path that has been broom swept after snowfall. All are celebrated not only in their own right, in their glorious thinginess, but because they give a reason to praise God. Quote, I do not think I have ever seen anything more beautiful than the bluebell I have just been looking at, he writes in March 1870. I know the beauty of our Lord by it. Just as kingfishers catch fire and dragonflies draw flame, so every element in the world takes, part in its, takes its part in a pageant of self-revelation. Text three, each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors, each one dwells, selves, goes itself, Myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. Like each mortal thing, Hopkins had his own singular sense of self-being, his own unspeakable stress of pitch, his own distinctiveness and selving. I'm quoting here from notes he made during an Ignatian retreat in August 1880. In the course of doing the spiritual exercises, his awareness of his own singularity was a cause for great rejoicing. My consciousness and feeling of myself, that taste of myself, of I and me, above all and in all things, which is more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum, more distinctive than the smell of walnut leaf or camphor. And yet, with that joyful consciousness of singularity could also come, when mood shifted, a sense of isolation, of being incomprehensible to others and therefore cut off from meaningful contact with them. Searching nature, he wrote, I taste self but at one tankard, that of my own being. The creative outburst of joy and gratitude Hopkins experienced when at seminary in Wales faded after the mid-1880s when he was relocated to Dublin. Desperately unsuited to his work as a teacher and separated from his English family and friends in an Ireland agitating for home rule, he discovered himself painfully to be an alien. To seem the stranger lies my lot, he wrote in a sonnet, my life among strangers. Correspondence with other poets like Robert Bridges and Coventry Patmore 
provided some companionship, but their almost total incompre incomprehension of his work had to be a source of sorrow as well as of annoyance. And then there was the mounting ill health revealed to his correspondents in letters that were otherwise preoccupied with music or literature or scholarly pursuits. For instance, under the heading health in the index to his collected letters, there is a slew of subtopics that give us a catalog of his miseries. Daily indigestion, an operation for piles, an adult circumcision, diarrhea and vomiting, chillblain, nervous prostration, nervous weakness, anemia, eczema, toothache, problems with eyesight, rheumatic fever. At the age of 45, he died of typhoid, apparently caused by the polluted water in his Jesuit residence. The dis-ease that dominated him, however, was psychological, an unhappiness that he felt at times to be leading him to the edge of madness. Writing to Alexander Bailey in April 1885, he confided, the melancholy I have all my life been subject to has become of late years not indeed more intense in its fits, but rather more distributed, constant, and crippling. The, the strange fruit, if you will, of this sad period was a clutch of poems referred to as his terrible sonnets that he told his friend Robert Bridges, quote, came like inspirations unbidden and against my will. This surge or afflatus had happened once before in 1877, his Annus Mirabilis. But now, instead of catching morning's minion or gleaning our savior in the barbarous beauty of the Welsh countryside, all Hopkins had was a sense of internal abyss. At one time, the tankard of the self may have been sweet to the taste. Now, it was poison. And here I read a poem that um, Mark Jarman gave to us yesterday. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. What sights you, heart, saw, ways you went, and more must in longer lights delay. With witness I speak this. But where I say hours, I mean years, mean life. And my lament is cries countless, cries like dead letters sent to dearest him that lives, alas, away. I am gall, heartburn, God's most deep decree bitter would have me taste. My taste was me, bones built in me, flesh filled, blood brimmed, the curse. Self yeast of spirit a dull dough sours. I see the loster like this, and their scourge to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. Has ever so much misery been packed so tidily into a Petrarchan sonnet? Or has unrequited love, Petrarch's subject in the Canzonieri, his sonnets, been written so poignantly? Hopkins has an AWOL lover who never calls, never writes, doesn't bother to pick up his mail, and lives, alas, away calling to God out of the depths with cries countless, and Oren, I think that's with a howl, and apparently for naught, Hopkins is stranded in the psalmist pit, cast off. In September 1883, as an earnest Jesuit, he had followed St. Ignatian's spiritual exercises and coolly meditated on damnation, quote, which is to see with the eyes of the imagination the length, breadth, and depth of hell. In this poem, however, 
he writes about hell from the inside. With witness, I speak this. Surely the lot of the damned must be worse than this darkness, but in the middle of the night's black hours, and note that the word hours is repeated three times in the poem. What does he have but gall, heartburn, the bitter taste of his own unleavened self-yeast, bones and flesh, blood brimmed, himself dissolving into the curse? No worst, another sonnet has it, there is none. Yet, Hopkins does not take this desolation quietly. Instead, he becomes openly argumentative with dearest him that lives, alas, away. And in a sonnet that dates from March 1889, one of several written in the spirit of the psalmist when he asks God why or how long. Placing himself from the outset of the poem within a scriptural frame, Hopkins aligns himself with the woebegone Jeremiah of Jeremiah 12. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I complain to thee, yet I would plead my case before thee. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why do all who are treacherous thrive? Thou plantest them, and they take root. They grow and bring forth fruit. Hoppens begins his poem with a Latin rendering of this text, taking it as an epigraph to his poem, as if to alert the reader, here beginneth the lesson. Then, after channeling Jeremiah in the Vulgate, he takes off on his own. The text is in the handout. Justus quidem tu es domine, et disputem tecum, verum tamen justa loquar ad te, quare via impiorum prosperator, etc. Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend with thee, but, sir, so would I plead is just. Why do sinners' ways prosper? And why must disappointment, all I endeavor, end? Wert thou my enemy, O thou my friend, how wouldst thou worse, I wonder, than thou dost, defeat, thwart me? O the sots and thralls of lust do in spare hours more thrive than I that spend, sir, life upon thy cause. See, breaks, banks and breaks, now leave it how thick, laced they are again with fretty shervil. Look, and fresh wind shakes them. Birds build, but not I build. No, but strain, time's eunuch, and not breed one work that wakes. Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. The sonnet echoes with the complaints of all those Old Testament friends of God who found themselves seduced and abandoned, but who in the state, in that state, don't fear to talk back. Life has been spent in the Lord's service, but in the end, what has it amounted to? Why must all I endeavor, disappointment end? The contrast with the wicked couldn't be starker. They prosper, the sots and thralls of lust, do in spare hours thrive. Or in the words of Psalm 92, 7, the workers of iniquity spring up like grass in the rainy season. They even flourish. He does not. You'll note that the speaker pleads his case by contending with apparent respect. He even uses the word sir twice when addressing his Lord, or is his tongue somewhere in his cheek here, sir? Still, what all but overwhelms the poem is the speaker's sense not only of being frustrated in his hopes, but of being defeated, thwarted, worsted, and precisely by the one whom he has been trying to serve. Sterile, dried up, he looks around him and sees, by contrast, the abundance of the leavid, laced world. The banks and breaks of even the meanest roadside ditch are vivid with green life. Wind moves like ruach breath through everything. Birds build their nests and await the birth of their young. But not I build, no, but strain, time's eunuch, and not breed one work that wakes. 
The work that Hopkins speaks of here is no doubt his ill-fated teaching career in Dublin. On January 1st, 1889, during what was to be his last spiritual retreat and only three months before composing this sonnet and six months before his death, he wrote in a journal, this evening I began to enter on that course of loathing and hopelessness which I have so often felt before, which made me feel madness and led me to give up the practice of meditation. I could therefore do no more than repeat, justus es domine et rectum judicum tuum, and the like. And then being tired, I nodded, woke with a start. What is my wretched life? Five wasted years have almost passed in Ireland. I'm ashamed of the little I have done, of my waste of time, although my helplessness and weakness is such that I could scarcely do otherwise. And yet the wise man warns against excusing ourselves in that fashion. I cannot be excused, but what is life without aim, without spur, without help? All my undercarrying undertakings miscarry. I am a straining eunuch. I wish for death. Yet if I died now, I should die imperfect, no master of myself, and that is the worst failure of all. Oh my God, look down on me. Together with the conviction of having been thwarted and defeated in his profession, disappointed in his vocation, worn down by illness, Hopkins also felt a loss of poetic power. To be sure, poetry for him had always posed a problem. He gave it up when he entered the Jesuits, burned his early verse, wrote again only with the permission of a superior, dismissed this aspect of his vocation in a letter to Robert Bridges. It always seemed to me that poetry is unprofessional, but that is what I've said to myself, not what others have said to me. No doubt if I kept producing, I should have to ask myself what I meant to do with it all, but I've long been at a standstill and so let things lie. I don't believe for a minute that this curt dismissal of poetry represented his deepest thoughts, nor can the terrible sonnets in any way be taken as a standstill, a mere letting things lie. Nonetheless, what had left him high and dry was the transfiguring vision that had once enabled him to see God's grandeur everywhere, in cows, in finches' wings, rose moles all in stipple upon trout, that swim, by contrast, nothing grows in his desert. And yet, even if Hopkins does not close the poem with an abrupt switch to the affirmative, such as we find in Psalm 22, he nonetheless ends with a supplication to the Lord of life. Send my roots rain. The showers of blessing never actually fall in this psalm of complaint. The desert never blooms, but in a final turn to God, at once suppliant and commanding, he gives evidence of a root of faith, a root struck so deep into bedrock that if not flourish, the poet's withered tree can at least weather the drought. Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. In closing, I think of Theodore Adorno's words, the need to let suffering speak is the condition of all truth. Hopkins knew this was to be the need, was also, excuse me, Hopkins knew that this same need was the condition of both poetry and prayer. With witness, he spoke as he did, honestly, whether considering the dappled lilies of the field or those cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. And so must any devotional poet worthy of the calling tell no lies about the drought and keep praying for rain. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank Peter and Constance for their remarks. Uh, because it's noon, and because I see English reading series students 
bunching at the back of the room. Why don't we, can we take maybe two minutes to adjust ourselves and bring, invite the poets up and allow people to take their seats and then we'll, uh, we'll proceed from there. In the interest of time, I'm going to forego the usual biographical um, introductions, but please know in these poets you will find an abundance of degrees, collections, laurels, and accolades. <laughs> So first, Josh Bell. Perhaps the quickest way to immerse yourself in the tornado, sometimes mistaken for Josh Bell, is to sample the titles of his poems. Nine of them mention zombies. That's got to be some kind of record. If you know of uh, a poet with more references to zombies, please let me know. In addition, he offers us the following. The horse leech's daughter. Poem to line my casket with, Ramona the care and feeding of mermaids, and sleeping with Julia Roberts. <laughs> Rather than look askance at pop culture or demurely tip his hat, Josh Bell has a more reliable method. Coat yourself in pop culture the way certain exuberant pooches roll in roadkill. Josh Bell makes it new, whatever it is in ways Ezra Pound could never have anticipated. Paradoxically, this maneuver makes us all a bit more alive and teaches us what to love. There's some DNA from the absurd in these poems, and plenty of New York school, and plenty from cartoons and B-grade movies we can't bear not to watch. There's also more than enough of straight Josh Bell, that gorgeous prophet, that tornado that just leveled Topeka and has its eye on Des Moines. <laughs> Kevin Prufer. Donald Barthelme once said that collage is the governing principle of the 20th century. And after reading Kevin Prufer's latest book, we might add of the 21st century as well. Prufer is a poet of juxtapositions, one who takes three or four stories that don't belong in the same poem and makes them not just comfortable bedfellows, but chimeric creature, one chimeric creature. He possesses a novelist's narrative reach and a poet's precision shot through with a gift for contemporary witness. For example, he writes of a bomb waiting to explode in a train and thus prays God, of lore tabs falling like snow, of a shoeless man who may or may not turn into an angel, of cartoon cats and mice teaching us about immortality, of alligators, real and metaphoric, sneaking into your garage of a father on his deathbed building a church in the air inches from his face. These poems pray and lament and question and celebrate only once in a while with bowed head. Pick up Melissa Range's first collection, Horse and Rider, and you'll find yourself carried away by a noble creature, a horse of tradition that knows the streets of lost Jerusalem and ancient Greece, a horse that nonetheless canters comfortably in the here and now. Stay long enough and you'll get so used to the equine rhythm of the poem you'll forget whether you are horse or rider. The range, pun intended, of these poems is impressive. Free verse, blank verse, sonnets of Villanelle. Melissa writes not only of heroes and saviors, of Achilles walking the beach, of Christ as a cavalry, commander, not only of a black foal that dies almost as soon as it is born, but of objects most poets pass right over, including various weapons of war, bow, arrow, battle axe, hand grenade, javelin, and trebuchet. Perhaps above all, Melissa Range is a poet of praise, apostrophe one of her favorite tropes. All things come to life under her choiring and inquiring voice, capital and lowercase gods included. What Richard Hauer once said of Jackie Oshiro's work might with equal aptness be applied to Melissa Range's poems. Quote, these are the tears and praise of Ruth amid the alien popcorn. <laughs> Please welcome our three poets. Hello, everyone. Oh, thank you all so much for coming out, um, not just today, but the last couple days. Uh, your questions in the panel yesterday were amazing, and, and
and this has been a really good time. Um, I appreciate it so much. Um, I found out a little late in my life that I could be considered uh, an imperial poet in an imperial land. Um, and so I've tried recently to embrace that. Um, and here's a poem. It's called Notes Toward an Imperial Poetry. No more masturbating in the gift shop. No more days dropping like child actors. Days like something Antigone might have buried. Days in which my friend and I hold hands in the street and eat up what the palmer worm hath not yet eaten and watch young people exercise and remind me what the old evil was again. Scrap of flag poking out of the dirt. We must deliver the claw hammer. Annihilator, step into the calendry. Rip off the head and gnaw on the neck peg as if we are dolls. Where the wages of the gift shop are wages. We're puncture to the small beasts who are deserving of it. Snood of the living body with the spirit bursting from its fold as lamprey, microscopics from another plane wriggling in its teeth. Where we're bringing King George back. No more dark rooms, no more dressing rooms. Not a doll that pees itself, but a doll that pees on other dolls. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that one snuck up on me. <laughs> I did not feel the spirit's anger was anarchic, was more English on it. Your body in the back of every ambulance in New York City. Yes, time was a gift, but not a gift you open so much as crawl into the box with. Call of Duty, the Battle of Tel Megiddo. Annihilator, if one wants a mother, one puts a mother. If one wants a father, then one goes ahead and puts one. Third person, limited, omniscient shooter. In the dark of the VIP room, death's going to let us put our little stickies on it. Elegy for it, how you tried to fit it how you couldn't keep it fit, and of the even smaller beasts who are deserving of it. And was it Monday's child who was full of hair? Is lubricant the only apology we'll ever need? No sundress for any sex or species in or around the annihilator. Antigone's holding hands with her friends in the street and she's sending out the Polaroids. Some are still the heavy favorite. Parts of the day left scattered behind in motel refrigerators all across the Northeast. Gnostic reviser, time clicking in the horse, voice the departure point of spirit from the flesh, and God's ascent as my thumb slips to its fit in the jugular notch, Antigone keeping lookout in the whale watch, and all these seaside cottages with photographs of seaside cottages on their kitchen walls. Annihilator, your voice is holy and it goes wherever you go. Do not take it with you into the gift shop. Do not hand its body to the adult acoustics. Death's going to let us put our little stickies on it one last time. Elegy for it and how I put it out of my misery. Lit it, how it won't stay lit. In this next poem I give, um, genitalia to an object that's not usually seen to possess genitalia in the way we think of it anyway. I bring that up only because I had a really long conversation with an editor who was thinking about publishing this poem and finally rejected it, um, in which we talked about what kind of genitalia could best actually fit this object. Um, it was a long conversation. Um, surreal, um, but it was the best rejection I think I've ever gotten. Um, this is also um, a poem. When I was teaching at Columbia, I taught, uh, I mentioned it yesterday, I think a class called the Bible as Workshop. And um, one of the things I liked about Genesis when I was teaching that class was how when the human made an advance in some way in Genesis upon death or um, cooperation with other countries, um, God would usually pop up and sort of wipe the slate clean and then start all over again. Um, so I, I decided that you needed to be careful when you complain and you had to complain only in a certain way 
or else you might bring about the end of the world. Um, I've read this poem out a couple times out loud, and so far, nothing bad's happened, so I think we'll be safe. This is called Complaint. The best fever had a brick for genitals, and it was an effective fever. We don't want to seem ungrateful for the having had of such a fever. Likewise, the heart in the kitchen of its chest. And from time to time, a person walked up and asked us if we knew directions either to the cinema or bed. Usually, we did. We were not a lowly bug or even something simple to be fooled at. The earth was known as round by us. We had a share of sex in the movie theater with that one lost person, whether him or her is not on the list of our present complaint. A person it was in need of directions, which we often knew of. A person with the fever that had the faces on it. And this was enough for happiness. It's just, and we hate to mention it, but there was the problem of our heads not growing back after we had cut them off of each other or ourselves tenderly in the bedroom with our lost person, turning to each other after a long day, helping to cut off each other's head in the accustomed manner, and fully believing we would see each other again. But of course, we learned too late that there would only be the cutting off of heads that once. Why did you fix it with the single decapitation? I know what you're thinking, but this is not a bid for immortality. We don't want to live forever, like bugs, or something simple to be fooled at. The coming fever, the one just ahead, with a number for genitals, is far too beautiful. We don't want to live forever. It's only that we'd like to die more often. There's a little bit of devotional going on in this poem. Um, I think you'll recognize some psalmic structuring, or at least some parallelism in some of the imagery. Um, and of course, the title comes from not the scripture, but a different scripture altogether. Uh, it's called Dollar Dollar Bill. <laughs> oh, Wu Tang fans. Dollar Dollar Bill. One more Jacobean kiss, and you'll wind up related to me. One more emotion and I'm coming for you like a sparrow. Set your phenomenology on the windowsill. Filthy, meet family. Family, I want to get marketable again. In the meantime, what are your thoughts on a completely male garden? As little closure, maybe, as there is a permanence. This being also the time of the wandering Miss Americas. Loose thumb bones rattling in a mint tin. One more emotion and both Dakotas will explode. One more condition and I'll be exiting my relevance. And what was it finally so dead about him, family? I think I just saw a fox. Yes, with its little fox and teeth like Ezekiel's. Of course, you were off busy revising your plague journals bringing clock to the belt line of Orion. What could have you done about the remaining days no longer outnumbering us? Voice of the dying groupie, like a deck of cards being shuffled. One last electromagnetic pulse, one last electromagnetic pulse and the neutral bodies of the dead dropping from our larger living bodies. The truth? I thought the castra castration threat a touch on the heavy side of the tonality. But you got your point across. And by then, we were a much cleaner people anyway. In my poetry workshops, because I fear my own authority, probably most of all, <laughs> um, I I started developing this other character which I could blame my criticism on um, called Page God. Um, and I would say, oh, don't do that, Page God wouldn't like that, that kind of thing. Um, and usually what starts out as a joke kind of turns serious for me. Um, and so I wrote a couple of poems which will probably be, um, 
They're all entitled Alamo theory. I spoke yesterday at the panel about how you can also sort of smuggle in political critique uh, into, into devotional poems. And so um, I address Page God and other thou's in this poem. Um, but that's, that's all I think I need to say in advance. Okay. It's called Alamo Theory. Night falling once like a horse through a bridge. Page God refusing to be survived. Page God hollering over one dirty haystack at who's at whoever's hiding behind the next dirty haystack. And no one's getting off of this tractor alive. No one without a pot of vanilla stuck like a witch's finger in the throat. Often who goes there isn't the bees, isn't the cherry trees. No one's darker than me. No one's big enough for pogroms. No one's grammar gets a pass. Can't you hear the popping of the Karen gun? Why the Hittites? Why the Etruscans? Sore and lost between vast greatness. See the mountains, their trauma halos of power line. OK, now show me your anagram. No, I don't even care. We bury a prom dress in the sand of every coast, sew a new prom dress from the flag of every coast. Jesus sat down calmly, fashioned himself a whip of leathern cord. Page God had never recorded premeditation at such levels. We never really learned the correct usage of the voice box either, but when we took ourselves by the neck, it was ancient, our language brave the living mammal pinned to its duration. The problem with the orgy always witness, witness, witness. Your breath comes out in a pretty cloud of blue, which is a different color than most people use. What a brand new giveaway. Students of the game have noticed that often before I shoot, I take the time to mention vegetation fretting somewhere across a fact lit red hill. It's getting late and I'm the only American on the dance floor still. Um, this is another poem that kind of comes from student exercises. Um, it, I, I often have my students write origin stories for their voice. Um, like comic book heroes often have an origin story. Um, it tends to make you think more often about the eye that you're using. Um, we talked a lot about the eye throughout the course of this symposium. Um, and I'll close with this one. I just want to say um, thanks to everyone, uh, Kim and Jay and everyone who's helped out. All, my, all the people who've like, gotten us back and forth and into the right chair in the right place. Thank you so much. This is called Where the Eye Comes From. Our days often ended and began with the sound of voices raised in song, even after we murdered our friends and neighbors, even after we brought the attention of our knives to the neighbors of our neighbors, until at last the neighborhoods fell silent and the cities quiet in the city's city, the country then and next the country, until finally the moon, as if its own reflection, looked upon an earth that we had emptied nearly back to Eden, even in that silence, which seemed almost a silence, sadly, we were not alone. All we ever wanted was to be alone, to visit no one, to be visited by nothing. But even after we'd traveled to nearby planets and relieved them of their voices, even after, and we all knew this was coming, we fell amongst each other, brother and sister, until only I survived. Still I heard it, the universe subtracted of its skin and hair, and yet the sound of a voice, like someone singing in the hold of a sinking ship, unbidden and irrelevant, a fathom and a fathom deep, but never fading. Thanks. I'm going to take off my glasses. Um, rendering you all invisible. <laughs> and, um, it, really, it really has been a lovely and uh, sort of long and lovely conversation we've been having. Um, and I've enjoyed listening to it uh, so much. And I'm just going to read, well, I have to put on a little bit so I can see the clock. 
Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read a, a few poems. And uh, I'll start with one new one and then read a couple from these most recent books. The, this new one is called In the Wheat Field. It's your rabbit, the officer told the soldier who pointed his rifle at the fleeing enemy child. The child was quick in the wheat, so it took three shots before he tumbled into the afterlife. Many years later, I put down my book about the war and walk under the oak's black branches to where the snow has capped all the cars in the elementary school parking lot. The rooftops glitter meanly. I have never killed anything, and look at me. I am like the boss of hell. In the silent movie, the moon took a rocket to the face and never stopped smiling. Tonight, its ashes scatter over the rooftops. No snow. Of all the people he murdered, that soldier could not forget how the child swayed a moment in the wheat before disappearing under the sea of it. I once found a bullet casing right here on this sidewalk and not far from it a stain. How could I not imagine the rest of that story? The cars grow cool and dire in the parking lot and the sodium lights hum like enormous insects. The soldier wrote a whole book about what he had done, but it didn't help. Come on and snow all over me. Come on and shower me with ash. The sky is a bone. The moon is a hole in somebody's skull. I've got a bunch of uh, sort of poems that have wars in them. I think it, it, it came from uh, spending so much time uh, right next to an Air Force base. Uh, th this poem. This poem, though, has stage directions, or you know, movie directions. It's about making a movie. So they're in brackets. I'm not sure how to handle that. Uh, I'll, I'll just go like this. And that means that that's, that's the directions for the person with the camera, or, or somebody on the film crew. This poem, it, this poem is called, In Some Parts of the Movie We're Comrades. In some parts of the movie, we're comrades and friendly. We're half drunk and youthful. In some parts of the movie, it's Saigon or Baghdad, dark streets and lonesome, oh, vacant-eyed natives, thick-tongued and eerie, wired in the jackets, cue music, cue chatter. In some were outnumbered, did you hear that? An enemy footfall, a whistle as if from afar, another and closer, vague in the moonlight, one comrade already dead, cue crickets, cue wind song through reeds, in others, loud bombers, in some prints, the glamour of flares and of tracers, sometimes such music, always the parachutes opened like palms or like blooms. We have a comrade who's sad, who misses his new wife back home. She writes him such letters, he shows us a click in the grass and he's dead. Cue to sad mountains, cue to the heavens where God lives. In some parts are handheld, and some parts are nightlit, so we're grainy, the camera keeps bouncing, unnerving. The hostiles approach us, you twist the black wire to the red one, the bomb holds its breath, our comrade keeps lookout, then later he's dead. The, then fire, the village is burning, then music uplifting, emphatic, cue fireworks, cue powder, how lovely our faces and perfect, the gape mouth, the blown into ribbons and dying, fantastic, and then from the rubble, just us and those footsteps, and uh, just us and those rooftops collapsing, just us, we're approaching the camera, we're sweat streaked and panting, we're battered and smiling, behind us the village keeps burning, our comrade is charring, cue credits, more rockets, more airplanes, more bullets, roll credits, such acting, in some parts, the audience loves us to pieces. This one's called On Mercy. <clears throat> Knowing he was soon to be executed, the condemned man asked if first he might please have something to drink, if first he might be drunk. So the soldiers brought him a drink, and because there was no hurry, another, and one for each of them too, and soon they were all very drunk, and this was merciful, 
because the man probably didn't understand when they put him to the wall and shot him. I'll marry the man who can prove this happened, the dying leaves said in their descent. I'll marry the one who looks through that window, the waiting grass tips said. But the sun went on with its golden rays like a zealous child, and the camera-eyed bees jittered mercifully in the distant branches. The man slept on the floor, and the little mouse in his head also slept, and the soldiers didn't know who would drag him away or where they should hide him. So they laughed nervously, and one of them offered the body a drink, ha-ha, a toast, then left him by the rich lady's liquor cabinet, where she'd find him when she came back from the hills. I'll marry the girl who kisses the lips and brings a breath to them, the starving horses said from their fields. I'll marry the man who pounds the chest and starts the heart, the caved-in houses said, and the windows let the light in until the sun failed in the branches and like mercy, darkness smothered the town. Later in the story, her grown son wrapped him in a parachute and dumped him in the neighbor's yard. Later that, neighborhood who that, later, that neighbor who understood bad luck dragged the man to another's lawn. And so he traveled, yard to yard, to the edge of town, where at last he slept by a little traveled road in a merciful ditch while the bombers unzipped the sky. And when the town burned, he missed it. And when the treetops bloomed and charred, he missed it. I'll marry the man, the grass tips said in the hot wind. I'll marry the girl, the horses said, running from their burning barn aflame, their bodies glowing bluely in the dusk. And no one proved it happened, which was merciful for us all. And the road forgotten, the man gone to root and weed, to marrow and tooth. And if it had happened, who would find his jawbone in the loam? Who would pick out his bullet shells and fillings like glitter in the new wood? And if a man should string them like words on a golden chain and make from them a charm and give give them to his wife, wouldn't that be mercy too? <laughs> I'm going to read just two more poems. Um, I was living in uh, uh, West Texas in this little town called Marfa for six weeks, and uh, there was nothing to do there, and I was supposed to be writing, and um, I can't write very much in a day, so I had about 22 hours a day of nothing to do. Um, so I, I started obsessively checking Yahoo News when I wasn't watching House Hunters. Or, um, <laughs> and um, I read this article about the disturbing frequency with which doctors leave, ob leave objects inside of patients before sewing them up. And um, this poem has three parts. I don't really know how to signal it, but maybe if I just say that there are these sort of three perspectives in this poem, then you'll, you can follow them. Um, one of them is from the perspective of the body on the table being operated on, you know, patient, looking up at the doctor and mistaking him for God. Um, one of the perspectives is that of the doctor, um, of the surgeon. And the third is like a Greek chorus of um, English professors who for some reason are in the room. <laughs> And they're commenting on what happens inside the room. It, the poem's called Inside the Body. He left a clamp inside the body, and only that night, lying in bed, did he realize what he'd done. This is why he couldn't sleep. This is why the next morning he was so tired he left a safety pin inside another body. This is why he forgot the sponge in the rib cage, the scope in the abdomen. This is why he forgot the tweezers and the acepto bulbs, the surgical retractor and the needle. He had such worries, he couldn't rest, and all day long he bent over sleeping bodies holding scalpels that inevitably he'd leave inside them before he sewed them up. When I woke, it was to a bright light, and God was bending over me. He's coming too, God said and his face grew large and blotted out the glare. Dear God, I was thinking, I cannot feel my legs. Dear God, I am like a mind floating over a table on which my body is sleeping. The university professor was saying that the body exists to demarcate the liminal space between the living and the dead. The body, she was saying, is a contested zone between presence and absence, between consciousness and eternal sleep, between the earth and the afterlife, between ourselves and the terrifying ambiguity of the void. 
the students wrote all of this down. The body, she said, is a foreign object, neither the person we know nor the empty husk that person leaves behind. It is a symbol unmoored from the limitations of meaning. My body was full of foreign objects, syringe, several yards of gauze, bone saw. I could see them glittering as I rose above the surgical lamps. And at night, the surgeon dreamed of the objects he'd lost inside his patients, lined up on long window sills, glittering in the playful sunshine, steel retractors, suction tips, drills, and calipers. In his dreams, his surgical mask fell off his face and into the body, his glasses too. In his dreams, he rolled up a white paper hospital gown, stuffed it into the incision, and sewed the patient up. His wife was leaving him. He'd had too much to drink. Are you all right, the nurses asked, shaking their heads. Are you sure? We bury the body or we leave it on a ledge to the darkness. We tie rocks around its legs and sink it in the sea. We put it in a bag and throw it from a cliff. We remove the indifferent entrails. We remove the brain piece by piece through the nose. We sew the eyelids shut. We sprinkle it with ochre. We stuff it with fruit. We stuff it with gold. We sew inside it wine and aromatic spices, a beloved family pet. So do we make of the emptiness of the body a vessel for the meanings we impose upon it, the professor told her students who wrote all of this down. <laughs> what would it mean to spend my last moments knowing that inside me the surgeon's wedding ring had clotted over, grown thick and blood encapsulated? His wife, anyway, had left him. His children disliked him. He'd been up all night drinking and left the shot glass in the body of a patient. <laughs> And when I opened my eyes, his face floated between mine and the surgical lamp, like God's holy visage. And so I hovered high above the heads of the nurses, above the breathing machine and its many cords over the poles and their dangling bags of fluids. Death must be distinguished from dying, with which it is often confounded, the professor said, holding up a book, while into my body the surgeon poured his drinks and tears. Into my body he stuffed his money. Into my body he lost his children and his wife. Into my body his distant youth vanished. When it goes, it takes our fears with it and creates new ones, the professor told her students, gesturing toward the surgeon who was washing his hands and crying. And after a while, the professor closed her book and went home to her life. The surgeon, too, returned to his quiet house and his fears. My body, empty of me, lay on the table like an overstuffed bag. All right, I'm just going to close with this last poem. Um, It's got this spooky little girl in it. Um, um, it's called Churches. In 1981, in a hotel gift shop outside Phoenix, Arizona, a little girl stood by the postcard rack, turning it gently. It creaked. She considered a picture of the desert, then looked around for her mother, who was elsewhere. She gave the rack a firm push so it spun gently on its axle, smiled, pushed it again, and the postcard rack wobbled on spindly legs. And soon she had it spinning so quickly the cards made long, blurry streaks in their rotation. Gasps of blue for sky, red for dirt, and then faster, the girl slapping at it with her hand, grinning at me. And then a single postcard rose from the rack, spun in the air, and landed at my feet. A picture of a yawning canyon, and then another, handfuls of postcards rising from the rack, turning in the air while the girl laughed and her oblivious mother at the other end of the store bought a map or a box of fudge, and then the air was full of pictures, all of them shouting, Phoenix, 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 twirling and falling until the empty postcard rack groaned once more, tipped and crashed through the window. There ought to be a word that suggests how we're balanced at the very tip of history, and behind us, everything speeds irretrievably away. It's called impermanence, the little girl said, looking at the mess of postcards on the floor. It's called transience, she said, gently touching the broken window. It's called dying, she said. It was 1981, and the clerk ran from behind the counter, stood before us. The girl smiled sweetly. The postcard rack glittered in the sun and broken glass. He turned to me, and my face grew hot. I couldn't help it. I was blushing. 
In 2009, my father lay in a hospital bed, gesturing sweepingly with his hands. What are you doing, I asked him. I'm building a church, he said. You're making a church, I said. Can't you see, he said. He seemed to be patting something in the air, sculpting something, a roof that floated above him. The hospital room was quiet and white. What kind of a church is it? I'm not finished. Is it a church you remember? Damn it, he said. Can't you see I'm busy? It was 1988 and I stood in line for my diploma and my father took a picture that I've lost now. 1984 and there we are around a campfire I can't remember. It was 2002 and his cells began to divide wrongly. First one deep in the wrist bone, then another turned hot and strange. Deformed, humpback and fissured, queer and off kilter, one after the other, though no one would know it for years. It's called dying, the girl said, while the postcard suspended in the air like a thousand days, and I reached out to touch one, and then another, and all at once they fell to the floor. Then the clerk said I was paying for the window. Where were my parents, and who was going to pay if I didn't know where my parents were? And the girl smiled from behind the keychains, and her mother pursed her lips at the far end of the store, and the window had a hole in it through which a dry breeze came, and the postcards shifted on the floor. Years later, my father was still making that church with his hands. They do that, the night nurse said, patting his head like he was a little boy. But he was concentrating on his church, his hands shaping first what seemed to be the apse, then fluttering gently down the transepts. He sighed heavily, frustrated, began again. Can I bring you anything else, the nurse asked. No, I said, thanks. Are you sure? She watched him tile the roof, watched his fingers shape another arch, and then it was much later and he'd fallen asleep, and outside snow covered up the cars. It's called forgetting, the girl said, while the clerk watched me and I blushed, until there's nothing left. And a breeze entered through the hole in the window, and then you're out of time, she said, and shrugged. Some of the cards were face up on the floor, two burrows climbing a craggy slope, the Grand Canyon like a mouth carved in the earth, a nightlit tower like a needle, and I was sweating now, but I couldn't speak. And then I was running from the shop, past the fountain and the check-in desk, down the tiled hall to the hotel pool, where my father lay on a plastic beach chair, reading a book about churches. Sunlight flecked his chest. His hair was wet from swimming. What's the trouble, he asked. First, his cells were thick and soupy, clotted and aghast, and then they were spinning through the air, and it was 1986, and rain drummed on the roof where it was snowing years later in Cleveland, his hands working the air while the nurse stood in the doorway and sighed. Wind and sun, a bright day, a lovely day to lie by the hotel pool and read about how men spent lifetimes building them and never saw them finished. Thanks. Hey y'all, can you hear me all right? Okay. Thank y'all so much for um, inviting me here. This has been such a great symposium, as everyone has said. Um, thanks especially to Kim Johnson, who is one of my favorite poets of all. Um, thanks for bringing me here. So um, I don't think any of the poems I'm reading today are very crazy. They're more mad, but I'll read them anyway. Um, so I'm going to read the title poem um, from my first book, which is called Horse and Rider, and it's um, based on a verse from Exodus, which is known as the Song of Miriam, um, which goes, Sing unto the Lord, he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he is cast into the sea. Um, when I was in theology school, um, I was taking Hebrew Bible, and, um, and then taking Hebrew, and my Hebrew professor said, scholars think this is the oldest fragment of poetry in the Bible. And that was interesting to me, so this poem came out of it. Horse and Rider. Sing unto the Lord a drift of a song, a song that goes before the law. Make of your voice a shaft of flame, shifting into cloud and back again, a rift in a wave, a crack in a wheel, a road in the midst of the sea. Make of your voice a staff turned snake, turned brass, turned tambourine. Sing of swift colts bolting from their mares onto the plains of tender sand, bolts of dyed silk rippling as they unfurl. 
cedar, sable, silver, sunset, snow. Sing of the vacant stables, the casks of grain, of the rakes and forks that lean against the stalls, of the stable boys, all younger sons, whose charges charge away. Sing of helmets hailed upon the fields, gold flax and barley rotting in the bud, of the bareheaded boys who urge their chariots on with surging throats, oh, sing of their black hair. Sing of the groomed hooves and flanks and haunches brushed blinding in the glare, jolting the riders they bear, all younger sons, until the sand tenders itself unto the sea. Sing this day of the gift of the Lord, the genesis of a song so old it has no attribution, of a tongue's first poetry, the gleaming shard which broke from prose, from simple speech, the jagged line which founded epic, identity, belief. Sing of defeat, for without defeat, how could we sing? Sing of swords, excuse me, sing of swords, shields, chariots, sifting down beneath the tangling reeds. Sing of the clear, dry heavens, the mottled sea, cedar, sable, silver, sunset, snow. Sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has slaughtered whom he has slaughtered. He has shown himself worthy of all our noise. He has rid the earth of a few more horses, a few more boys. So I talked to them yesterday about how I've started this um, sonnet series. Um, and I'm going to read a few of those since we talked so much about sonnets yesterday. These are um, all poems that are about the pigments that medieval monks used in, created in creating illuminated manuscripts. So this first one is called Verdigris, and it's about a green pigment. Verdigris. Not green as new weeds or crushed juniper, but a toxic and unearthly green, meat for inking angel wings, made from copper sheets treated with vapors of wine or vinegar, left to oxidize for the calligrapher. When it's done, he'll cover calf skin with a fleet of knotted beasts in caustic green that eats the page and grieves the paleographer. There's copper in my brain, my heart of hearts, in my blood, an essential mineral. Too much is poison. Too much air imparts sickness to the script. Once begun, eternal, its words forever grass in drought. Nor departs my grief, green and corrosive as a gospel. So sometimes the process of making pigments could be kind of gross. Um, this one involves um, squishing bugs to make red ink. It's called Kermes Red. Called crimson, called vermilion, little worm in both the Persian and the Latin. Red eggs for the carmine dye. The insects brood crushed stillborn from her dried body. A swarm in a bath of oak ash lye and alum to form the pigment the Germans called St. John's blood. The saint who picked brittle locusts for food, whose blood became the germ of a crimson storm. Christ of the pierced thorax and worm red cloak. I read your death was once for all, but it's not true. Your kings and bishops command a book, a beheading blood for blood, the perfect hue. Thus I, the worm, the Baptist, and the scarlet oak 
See, all things on God's earth must die for you. Well, here's another cheery poem <laughs> about soot. And um, this is called Lamp Black. It's a pigment. I'm an ink made from soot. Lamp Black. Black as a charred plum stone, as a plume from a bone fire, as a flume of ravens startled from a battle tree. This lantern resin the monk calls from soot to quill the doom and glory of the Lord won't fade. The grime of letters traced upon the riven calf's skin gleams dark as fresh ash on a shriven penitent as heaven overawing time. World's glim, grim cinderer, is it sin or history or a whimsied hex that burns all life to tar? We are dust, carbon spilled out from your word a lamp overturned into the pit of pitch beneath your pen, the ink horn filled before the world was born. It's too bad I didn't select a single funny poem to read. <laughs> I actually do have them, but I didn't pick them. Um, so this, um, this next one, is, um, this is about a particular um, Bible. Um, medieval treasure Bible, they were called. So these are Bibles that are not only illuminated, but they're kind of hyper-illuminated. There's, there's gold on every page. There's purple ink. There's ivory bindings, possibly encrusted with jewels. Um, so this one is um, the Gospel Book of Otto III, which is from around the 10th century. And this is called Gold Leaf. Shines forth from the vellum this film of sun, the precious metal pounded thick as air, then bound to the page with gesso or with glare. More than 100 leaves of gold from one ducat. Otto, on the gold leaf throne which he commissioned, servant of Christ, ruler of the world, surveys his gilded empire, and the hand of God adjusts his crown. O oh Christ, how I have loved you with my heart shut like an emperor's fist or a golden door, a Bible with its pages locked up tight. In my poverty, I sought a poor God to adore, a love I could buy with my widow's might. But this is not a Bible for the poor. This, um, I'm going to read one more sonnet and then one other, one other poem. Um, and this one is... Um, about, it's not actually a pigment, it's called shell white, and you kind of need to bleach the pages before you can put color on them. It's made of shells. Shell white. The monk grinds bleach from mollusk carapace, pestles his basket of beach combed sea crumbs so limed hides might beam brighter for the lamb. Before he paints in sippet, interlace, he blenches before the page as if it were the face that he might hope to glimpse in prayer, numb within the blizzard of love that strikes dumb the heart, shell-shocked before the story's grace. Eye full of snow, dazzling blank, I believed you once the union of all light and pled the searing of my eyes. Then I blinked. My wool puller, my white hot blind spot, I'm washed up, shelled out, your thankless monk, or else the page you'd scour, whitewash, illuminate. Do we have any Anglo Saxonists in the house? <laughs> no? Oh, come on. Um, one thing I didn't talk about yesterday is that Old English poetry has been really influential um, on my own work um, in a lot of what I do, and particularly in the manuscript that I have been reading from these last few poems. Um, there's a lot of dialogue with Old English poetry going on. Um, so this poem is um, in dialogue with the poem The Dream of the Rude, 
um, which is so wonderful. Um, and so I was actually taking an Old English class and learning how to read Old English and translating this. And um, there's a phrase in the poem that um, is translated as, all creation wept. And I raised my hand and I said, all creation, everything? You know, rocks, pieces of paper, everything? The teacher says, everything. So that blew my mind. So I wrote this poem. This is called, All Creation Wept. All creation wept, and not just those disciples whom he loved, and not just his mother. For all creation was his mother. If he shared his cells with worms and ferns and whales, silt and spider web, with the very walls of his crypt. Of all creation, only he slept, the rest awake and wrapped with grief when love's captain leapt onto the cross, into an abyss the weather hadn't dreamt. Hero, mind the beloved, cried snowflakes, cried the moons of unknown planets, cried the thorns in his garland, the nails in his flesh, the spikes of dry grass on the hillside, dotted with water and with blood, real tears, and not a trick of rain light blinked and blurred onto a tree so that the tree seems wound in gold. It was not wound in gold or rain, but in a rapture of salt, the wood splintering as he splintered when he wept over Lazarus, over Jerusalem, until his sorrow became his action, his grief, his victory until his tears became a rupture in nature. All creation discipled to his suffering on the gilded gallows tree, the wood which broke beneath the weight of love, though it had no ears to hear him cry out and no eyes to see. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thanks for your participation in the symposium. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but we will have uh, the poets and other participants in the Special Questions classroom come over and visit and get a book signed. Once again, uh, thank you very much for coming.